Good evening. This is Pastor Ken with Warsaw Baptist Church. We are so happy to have you joining us for this live stream of a, a Good Friday service. Again, it breaks our heart that we are not in this room together with you, uh, but until we are able to do that again, we are trying to make every effort to get the gospel to you where you are. Uh, we're going to do that in a couple of different ways tonight. We're going to do that in singing praise to the God who saved us. Uh, that's what we're celebrating tonight. We're celebrating the fact that God came down and not only lived a perfect life in our place, but also died the death that we deserve to die so that we could be adopted into his family. We are so grateful for the gift that we've received from him. We are so uh, so so very aware of the price on a night like this. And, and really, our hearts should always be tuned into that. Uh, but I'm just like you. Uh, the distractions of this world do get in the way, uh, and and we just want to right now just quiet our hearts, maybe uh, turn off any other devices, and just look at this one and and get into the spirit of worship. And uh, our our singers and our uh, musicians are going to start that out, and then our our pastor Randall Beach is going to bring a message from the scriptures. Uh, this is not our ideas. This is not anything new. This is a story that's been told. For 2,000 years, it's the most important story that you will ever hear in your life. Uh, it's the story of how God made sinners like us right with him. And so we want you to enjoy this. We want you to be moved by this. We're praying that the Holy Spirit will not only be working through our singers and musicians, not only working through our preacher, but also will be working on your heart as you listen to this. Uh, we're praying that if you're, he if you're listening to this, if you're watching this, and you are not yet a believer, we're praying that the Holy Spirit would just tackle your heart tonight and bring you into the family. If you are a believer and you're like me, you've just been uh, very uh, distracted by the things that are going on in this world around us, uh, we want the Holy Spirit to just grab us and lead us back to the cross and just remind us the biggest problem we ever had was dealt with at Calvary. And we want you to receive the hope that comes from that. So I'm going to pray. And then our musicians are going to lead us in song. And then Randall is going to come and lead us in the word. Let's pray. Father God, I am overwhelmed by gratitude. I am overwhelmed by the, the ease in which I sometimes can fall into temptation. The ease in which I can fall into distraction. The ease in which I can fall away from just a adoring you. And Lord, what has been tr proven true in my life and so many of our lives is when we take our eyes off of the cross and the empty tomb, our eyes drift down to something so much less important. Uh, sometimes huge problems rise up because we're seeing them without the, the shadow of the cross falling on them. But Lord, when we see your cross and what you've done for us, Lord Jesus, when we see the, 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 the description in your word of the, the brutal sacrifice that you endured for us. All of the other problems of this world seem to fade away. And even the good things of this life stop holding our heart hostage. So Lord, I pray that this would be an evening where all of us are drawn closer to you. I pray that this would be an evening when all of us are, are overwhelmed. And I pray that you would just remove the noise, remove the distraction, remove the things that are going on in our hearts and minds that would, that would limit us and would keep us from singing out to you, that would keep us from hearing your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just get our hearts, minds, eyes, ears focused on the one thing that is important. Lord, I pray all these things in your precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now where you are, uh, whatever you're watching this on, I want you to sing out loud with the, with the singers and with the musicians here. I want you to sing out loud where you are. Make your neighbors pound on the wall and tell you to be quiet. Sing out. This is worship, and we want you to worship God in this moment. God bless you.
Okay. Can you hear me? Are we on? Awesome. Amen and praise God. It's Good Friday. Good Friday is good for a reason. Um, even if we were able to gather here, you would be surprised to see me here on Good Friday. Um, I was watching the live stream as I was getting ready to come up. I saw my sister Melanie on there, and uh, <clears throat> I'm missing my second family, my second church family at Second Baptist Carrollton. I wanted to give them a little bit of a shout out. That's normally where I am on Good Friday, but I love, I love this time of year, and I love God's Word. And I've been called to preach, and I couldn't not on Good Friday. So uh, if I can get through it, as you can see, I'm kind of wrapped up in the emotion of everything. I'm going to begin by reading a passage from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, the first one that we have recorded, starting in chapter 15. I'm just going to read the first few verses of chapter 15 where the Apostle Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which I received, which you received, I'm sorry, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. My job tonight is to preach this gospel to you and to my own heart. Good Friday is called good because of what Jesus did for us on the cross 2,000 plus years ago. Not for anything else, but only because of what he did. So let's pray and dig in, shall we? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you even more for the truth of this gospel that I get the honor and the privilege to preach to your people and to those who will become your people tonight. Please bless my words that they be your words. Get me out of your way. Hide me behind that, that wondrous cross we just sang about. And help me to clearly articulate your words tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to back up and go to the last gospel account, the gospel of John. And talk about one of the most powerful passages that I forget to read over and over. Jesus, before he was arrested... Before he even prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed with his apostles, for his apostles, for those that were with him, 
and for all of us. And we have that prayer recorded by the beloved Apostle John in chapter 17. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I have had with you before the world existed. See, Jesus did not need any glory from any one of us. Jesus did not need to be given any authority based on our belief in him. Jesus did not need to be given permission to do anything because he's God. Because his authority comes from God the Father from eternity past before the world even existed. That's what he's declaring in the first part of this prayer for us to hear. God doesn't need to be reminded of who Christ is, but we need to know. So he tells us here the authority over all flesh Christ has had from eternity past. And here, while he's still on earth, a couple thousand years ago, he prays to the Father and asks him to give eternity to whomever he has given him. See, he goes on to say in verse 6, I have manifested or revealed or made known, depending on your translation, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. But the question is, do we? We've got to ask ourselves now, a couple thousand years out, do we really believe what Jesus says about himself right here. Do we believe that Jesus is God and from God, from all eternity? Jesus left the throne of heaven to be a man, to be born of the flesh, to live a life that followed the law to the letter with zero sin. Do we really believe that Jesus is who he said he is and that he's done everything he's done for us? Because, folks, he says right here that he has. He says back in chapter 14 that he is the way. Thomas had asked him, he said to him, Lord, do we not know where you're going? We do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Amen and amen. Do we know Jesus? Because we have to in order to know God. We have to in order to get eternity. See, nobody gets out of this life alive except those who follow the one who died on that cross way back then for our sake. Verse 9 says... I am praying for them 
This is Jesus again speaking to the Father. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them, and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except for the son of destruction, that the scripture may be fulfilled. He came for his own. That is a qualifier. That is something specific. He did not come for everybody in the world. If he had died on that cross for every single soul that was ever, ever created, ever, that he failed, and Jesus doesn't fail. He came for his own. He came for the ones that God gave him. He came for us, the church. He came for his own. That's a hard truth for a lot of people to hear, and people will take that truth and they will twist it into some twisted, sick doctrine that is not what we believe. Hear me, saints and sinners alike, hear me. No one will ever be turned away. We're getting there. Hang on. I love one of the illustrations I was given about the doctrines of grace once. I don't like all the other terms around it. The doctrines of grace are true, and I love the way they sound when you say it that way. But the doctrines of grace are not about everybody beating down the door of heaven and God saying, no, just you and just you and just you. It's everybody running away from God and God still loving us enough to send his son to die on a cross and reach out and grab those who are running away from him and say, no, there's a fire there. Don't go there. That's what the grace of God means. That's what this means. He came for his own. And he does not lose one of them. If you belong to him, you belong to him period. That's the end. There's nothing you can do to jeopardize that. It's God's work that saved you. Christ's sacrifice that saved you. Nothing of yours. It's not you do your best and Jesus does the rest. Christ did it all. We're getting there. We're getting there. Verse 13, but now I am coming to you in these things. I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 14, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I and not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is the truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, for their sake, I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. We'll talk more about truth in a little while. Jesus gave us God's word. Jesus gave us God's word. The only thing we are going to have to answer to God for when we leave this earth is, I gave you my son and my word. What did you do with them? That's it. That's it. We are either going to glorify God in our submission to this blood that Christ gave to sanctify us, or we are going to glorify him in being cast away. That's it. But either way, we are going to glorify our God someday. Someday. You know, as I was reading this this week, I mean, I had a whole other thing planned. 
my brother, I keep glancing up at him. He's been with me, all, hearing me all week, back and forth, text, phone. All week, I've had a whole other thing planned. And then I read this, and I, I'm still emotional. Um, he's not lost any of his own. He says to the Father in verse 20, I do not ask for these only. And this is the good part, okay? I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Folks, that's us. These are their words. These are the witnesses that were written down for our sake so that we may be saved. He says, I do not ask for these only, but also those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you Father are in me and I in you that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This does not negate John 3 16. He loved the world so much that he sent his very own son to die for his people that they would be witnesses for him and of him to the world. That's the job folks. That's the job. Be witnesses for Christ to the world in his word, in truth, and in nothing else. In nothing else, not in declaring anything except his word. And only his word and his truth. 22 says, verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become one perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even if even as you loved me how many times have we heard it folks there's so many different beliefs there's so many different denominations how can you all claim to be christians folks there are several things that are hills worth dying on if it's by grace through faith in christ we can argue about the rest of it we are one in him regardless of what name is over the door as long as we can proclaim that we are saved through grace we are saved by grace through faith in christ by the power of the holy spirit and that's it by nothing we have done or can do can we be saved that's it that's the main thing all the rest of it we can argue about but that's the main thing and that's what he's talking about. Those who proclaim the main thing, the truth of Christ crucified. That's who he's talking about. That's the church, little c, global. That's us. That's us. He says in verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. Oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. How does he continue to make his word known? He continues to make his word known by the witnesses that wrote down what they saw and by those of us who proclaim it to this day. Folks, there's only one man in history that split time. There's only one man in history who was so important that even if you don't believe in him, you have to count time by his life, and that is Jesus Christ, and he loved us so much that he not only gave us all of this, but he died so that you and I could be saved. That's it. That's the truth that is proclaimed by him himself in his word right here. Right here, but we're not the first to deny it. John doesn't give a whole lot of detail. He says, after that, he says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron. I don't know why, but I can see today. We'll just leave those there. Where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. He doesn't give a lot of detail there. 
of that moment. But we know from Matthew 26, from Mark 14, from Luke 22, that Jesus prayed also to have this very cup that he's talking about, the cup of God's wrath, removed if it were the will of God. Let's, let's go to Luke chapter 22. <clears throat> Starting in 39, he says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter temptation folks how often do we find ourselves asleep how often do we find ourselves nodding off at the wheel how often do I find myself sleeping when I should be praying not focusing on Christ. You know, it's, it's hard not to feel guilty about stuff like that, but you got to think, these are his closest friends on earth at the time. They're falling into the same trials that we are. It's hard sometimes to stay focused on God's Word and not fall asleep, but I'm telling you, that's what we're called to. That's what we're called to because right after that, right after that, the betrayer showed up and he brought an army. You know, it's ironic and it's another thing that John doesn't talk that deeply about. Jesus tells them when they go to arrest him, hey, where, were you, where have you been? <laughs> I've, been I've been preaching in the temple every day. You haven't come to me there and arrested me like a criminal. Let's read. So Judas, verse 3, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, he went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him. Folks, this is the son of the very God of very gods, and he knew he knew what he was about to face, and yet he didn't flee. He didn't turn. He had already prayed to God and asked that the cup be removed when God said no. He knew he had to do what he had to do because he's God. Knowing what would ha all that would happen to him came forward. Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them, and we know from other accounts that he kissed him to identify him. But Judas was there among them. Verse 6, When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. What better time to flee, right? But no, he said, so he asked them again. Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, did what Peter does. 
He drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? He had just prayed to have that cup pass away from him. But then he looks at his own disciple, his own apostle, and he said, shall I not drink it? He knew what was going to happen to him. We know then that Christ was arrested. They took him to the high priest to be questioned. Peter denies Christ just as Jesus had told him he was going to. And then, then they stood him before the highest authority in that land at that time, Pontius Pilate. They took him there. And there's a couple exchanges, and I'm not sure if I got all the verses to my brother in time, but I want to talk about two exchanges that Jesus had with Pilate. In verse 33 of chapter 18, Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have, or what have you done? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered, might not have been delivered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So Pilate said to him, so, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say, that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Not a truth, not some truth, the truth. Everyone who is of the truth, the truth, listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? Folks, this is a freebie. Wrote this into it. This is, this is a freebie. Pilate is no different than the folks of today. How many of us have been hit with, well, you know, that's your truth, and this is my truth, and I'm, I'm going to live my truth and let you live your truth. Well, there's a rapper that wrote a really cool song, and in the middle of it he says, well, if my truth says your truth is a lie, is it still true? Because folks... The truth of Jesus Christ proclaims every other truth, all the other truths to be a lie, all of them. The gospel is offensive for one reason and one reason only. It is not of this world. Jesus Christ has proclaimed to God in front of his disciples that he is not of this world, and we, those of us who follow him, are not of the kingdom of this world. And when Pilate, the highest authority in the land on the earth that time with Jesus, the guy who's got his hand, we're going to get there in a second, who's got Jesus' very life in his hands, asks him, are you a king? He says, says, my kingdom is not of this world. And that's the truth, the truth. But we are still in this world. Thank God we serve a king who's not. Amen? That's what I say. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord because the prince of the principalities of the air of this earth is not somebody I want to watch, I want to follow. So there's another exchange down here in chapter 19, starting in verse 10, where Pilate says to him again, so you will not speak to me. Now, don't forget, back it up a little bit, don't forget chapter 19, verse 1, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. Now, we don't know if he did it himself or if he had a guy whose job it was to whip the prisoners. In another place, it's called examine them. With that cat of nine tails that was so vicious that it ripped the skin from the bone 
Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns. And I know we've got all this imagery of this pretty little twined crown gently placed on the head of the king. No, no, that's not how it was. It was a bunch of thorns. Who knows how thick, long, sharp thorns, painful thorns driven onto his scalp to the point that it drew blood, a lot of blood. A lot of blood in mockery in mockery the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head and they arrayed him in a purple robe and they came up to him saying hail king of the Jews and struck him with their hands Pilate went out again and said to them speaking of the Jewish leadership see I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him so Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. A mockery, a brutal and disgusting mockery of his kingship. He came out wearing that purple robe. Pilate said to, the, to them, behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, folks, they didn't have any pity. This man had taught in their temple for years. They knew who Jesus was. They had questioned him day in and day out, and all of them had had face-to-face, face-to-face encounters with him, and instead of having any sympathy for this man who had been beaten to the point of exposed bone, who had had a crown of thorns driven into his skull, who had had this robe thrown on him as a mockery of his kingship, he's paraded out in front of them, naked except for the robe, and just covered in his own blood. And he says, Behold the man. And when they saw him, they cried, Crucify him. Crucify him. How cruel are we? Because we would have done the same thing. None of us is any better than they are. Every time we sin on purpose, knowing, knowing that it is in the face of a holy God who did this for us, we are screaming, crucify him. That hurts. And if it doesn't, maybe like me, you need to do a gut check, because I had to. I had to. Pilate didn't want any part of it. He said, he said to them, take him yourselves and crucify him. We have a law. And according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Remember, this is the most powerful man in that region at that time. The only guy who has more power in that region is Caesar himself, maybe the governor in between him and Caesar. That's it. In Judea, covered by or or ruled by the Romans, Pilate's the dude. And he's afraid. Something in Jesus made him afraid. And he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Think about it. He had just beaten him within an inch of his life. Why would Jesus give him anything? So Pilate said to him, you will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Folks, crucifixion was an example. Crucifixion was and still to this day is considered one of the cruelest forms of torture and death known to man. It puts a human body on display for the whole world to see as a warning. Don't do whatever that guy did. And to this day, it's used in countries around the world as an example not to be Christians. Remember that. 
When you see that voice of the martyrs thing come across your page, remember that. When you think that it's hard that we can't meet right now, like I've had thoughts that it's hard that we can't meet right now. There are people to this day who are being crucified for the sake of this same gospel that we are proclaiming tonight. To this day. Pilate reminds Jesus, don't you know I have the authority to either let you go or to crucify you? And what's Jesus' response? Jesus answered him, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. He's beaten, bloody, been mocked, spit on, this crown driven onto his head, He's been screamed at by his own, by the Jews. Crucify him. And yet he looks Pilate in the face and says, you only have what I've given you. Because he's already proclaimed he is God. And his authority comes from God. So the authority to crucify him or not comes only from God. God doesn't fail. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. And from then on, Pilate sought to release him. And I'm just basically going to read to you what the rest of the scripture says on this subject. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release This man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. Ah, I got to stop there. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. What are they worried about, folks? They're worried about politics. They're worried about their position in the kingdom. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in Aramaic, Gabbatha, or Gabbatha. Now, it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold, your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? And listen to this. The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. The chief priests. The chief priests, the people, the men who were supposed to be the representatives of God's people to God as their only king said, No, we have no king but Caesar. They had already set God aside completely. They were no priests at all, just priests of men. That's it. They had their power, and they wanted to hang on to it, just like all the rest of us. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified, verse 16. (laughs) So this is the really hard part. Even harder than the thoughts of the the whipping and that, that terrible crown of thorns. See, they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross. We're going to nail you to this piece of wood, dude. Carry it. This one is yours. You have to carry it so that you can be paraded through the streets and mocked and cursed. And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote a transcription, or an inscription, I'm sorry, and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. Remember, it's an example to others, And it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, 
but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. See, that's how we know that the cross looked like this and not like this because the inscription had to be above his head. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier and also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which said, says they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. Folks, I've repeated it just about every time I've ever talked about the crucifixion in a pulpit, but you need to know he was not an ivory white sculpture, clean and pristine with a little cloth covering his privates. They stripped these people naked on purpose to shame them. Our Savior, the one who is God and is perfect, who led a perfect life, not only beaten to the point of death anyway, not only nailed to a cross, but stripped naked and shamed in front of all who walked by. Imagine the shame of that. The absolute despair human despair of a moment that way they've taken everything human from him at that moment so the soldiers did these things but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he had loved standing nearby he said to his mother woman behold your son then he said to his disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Took care of his mom. How human is that? How human is our God? <laughs> our God become flesh. And so real was that flesh to him as a man that he took care of his mom before he gave up the ghost while he's being crucified and put to shame for, us, for crimes that you and I committed, not any that he had done. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the Scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. When Jesus bowed his head, and said, it is finished. He meant it is finished. All the work of our salvation, all the work of my salvation, all the work needed to save you from whatever sin it is that you're living in, packing around, proud of, ashamed of, whatever you're carrying, lay it down at the foot of that cross where Jesus said, it is finished. Because we can't fix it. We can't fix it. The cross fixed it. Our Savior took the cross in order to fix it. Now, he had already told those who were with him what was going to happen. But just like them, 
even us now, knowing what's, what's coming, knowing every Sunday, every first of the week, we celebrate the same thing over and over. The resurrection is coming. We know it's coming, and yet we still hang on to this sin. We still hang on to the shame that he took on our behalf because we're afraid. They were afraid. They ran for their lives after declaring their fealty and their love to this Savior just like we did. Folks, lay down your life for him. Just give it up. All he asks for is everything. That's all he asks for. Surrender. Just throw your hands up. He did the work. He did the work. He doesn't save us because of our works. He calls us to serve him because of what he's done for us. There's work to be done, but that work isn't what's going to save you. There are holy things that we are called to do for our Savior, but that's not what saves you. It is finished. He did it that day. Over 2,000 years ago, once and for all, the final sacrifice in the sacrificial system made for you and for me. He'll not lose one. Not one. Not one will be lost ever who belongs to him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ, empowered by you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to live that perfect life following every letter of the law that you <laughs> that you've called us to, knowing we can't. Thank you so much for allowing your Son Jesus Christ to pay the penalty for my sin for our sin. Thank you so much for loving us enough to pour out your wrath on your very own son for our sake. Please, Father, forgive us when in fear we lose sight and we run. Help us to be reminded that our salvation is at the foot of that cross and in the power of of what's coming shortly thereafter. Lord Jesus, thank you for being willing to submit to the Lordship of the Father and take my sin to the cross for my sake. Forgive me from the times when I lose sight of that. Forgive us all when we forget who you are. Holy Spirit, thank you for empowering us to receive salvation in Christ's blood and to proclaim this gospel to the world. Forgive us when we don't. Please, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Good night.